Okay, our next speaker is Matt Engel, and he's going to be speaking in solid conductor for cellular nanoelectrodes for neural recording. Hi, uh, so I'm a joint postdoc between the Max Planck Institute for Medical Research in Heidelberg and Stanford University now. And uh, today I'd like to talk to you about what I hope will become the next generation of uh, electrophysiological techniques. Um, I should get, preface this by saying that um, the work that I'm showing is um, still in progress, and so uh, we're not there yet. Those of you who are doing patch recordings, don't throw out your equipment. Um, but I think that we're, we've made some exciting progress, and so I'd like to tell you about it now. Uh, so I think Jeff Lickman did a very good job uh, yesterday explaining the complexity of the nervous system. But now I think about just um, on the scale of a single neuron, there's already a lot going on. Um, so neurons receive thousands of inputs from presynaptic partners, and then they convey uh, this information to uh, downstream cells. And the relationship between these inputs and outputs uh, really represents the function of the cell. And so as neurophysiologists, uh, we'd like to better understand this relationship between inputs and outputs. So we'd like to ideally measure both. And the most direct way of measuring both the inputs and outputs of a cell would be to record the transmembrane potential. Uh, this raises a little bit the question, how long do you have to record the transmembrane potential to understand the function of a cell? And so um, I want to just give a few sort of examples of, of, of processes that we might be interested in. Um, one of them, let's, let's say the induction of immediate early genes. Um, from induction to uh, peak protein expression is about two hours. Uh, so we could imagine wanting to make a continuous intracellular recording that would last two hours. Um, but even, that there's an example where the, the process is in, intrinsically time consuming, but we could also imagine something like um, basic receptor field characterization um, that doesn't take, it, it doesn't take a lot of time to do it once, but if you really want to investigate an input space, like say in olfaction, if you wanted to uh, try to characterize the input space of olfaction, I mean there are a lot of things that you can smell, there are a lot of chemicals, chemical space is very large, and if stimulus adaptation rates are slow, it could take a very long time to even do basic uh, receptive field characterization in a system like the olfactory, the olfactory bulb. Um, so there, that, that could take something on the order of three hours to deliver 100 odorants uh, 10 times with 10 second uh, interstimulus uh, intervals. Um, Something that everyone's very interested in, uh, long-term potentiation, long-term uh, synaptic plasticity. So I just sort of grabbed a random example from the literature, uh, a competition protocol where you induce LTP in two different pathways, and then you have, um, you block protein synthesis, and you test the persistence of these two pathways, and, and you can see how they compete with one another. If you reactivate one pathway, it comes at the expense of the other. And uh, an experiment like this takes about 10 hours. Um, finally, if we talk about animal behavior, uh, the Morris water maze test, where you drop a rat into a baby pool filled with opaque liquid, and then let it swim around for a while until it finds a hidden platform. Um, if you keep dropping it into the pool, eventually it learns where the platform is, but peak performance can take on the, uh, on the time scale of days. Uh, so this, these are the kinds of processes that we might be interested in. But when you look at the state of the art for intracellular recording, whole cell recording, a good whole cell recording lasts uh, about 30 minutes before you start to change cellular properties. So there's a real mismatch in time scales. And even if you want to be generous, um, maybe you can get an hour from a whole cell recording if you don't care about washing out certain cellular constituents. Um, so I'd really like to start working on uh, bringing these two time scales uh, to sort of correspondence. Um, to talk a little bit about what we might, how we might want to design the next generation of intracellular recording electrodes, I think it's useful to look at how uh, current intracellular recording technology uh, is limited. So, for example, um, for those of you who aren't familiar with whole cell recording, um, we take a glass pipette that's filled with saline, a saline solution. Um, the glass can form a tight seal with the membrane, and then it's so tight that if you rupture that patch, uh, then you can have an electrically tight seal between the uh, lumen of the capillary and the uh, cytoplasm of the cell, giving you electrical access uh, to the cell. Unfortunately, the volume of the patch pipette is much, much, much larger than the uh, volume of the cytosol. So if you wait for too long, uh, the two bodies come into equilibrium and you end up washing out everything that was in your cell. Um, 
This is, I think, really well demonstrated by this iconic image of a, a dendrite and soma being patched at the same time with two different colored dyes. And you can see that um, in the same way that the dye flows into the cell, things from the cell flow into the uh, patch pipettes. Um, Push and Nair did a very important study on this sort of time constant for uh, dialysis for different types of molecules in, uh, in cells of let's say, specifically 15 microns, but that's sort of an average for, uh, for, for uh, the neuronal uh, cell uh, body. Um, so they found that this uh, dialysis is related to both the access resistance of the recording and to the molecular weight of the molecule that's uh, diffusing. And, uh, just sort of a quick reference, um, ATP would be dialyzed in about 48 seconds, and something larger like uh, monomeric actin would take about 3.5 minutes. And you could say, yeah, sure, but I can put that into my internal solution, um, and I can try to uh, substitute these things back in, but you can't guess all of the constituents of the uh, intracellular milieu, so you really have to uh, come up with a solution uh, for this dialysis problem. A kind of old, a solution that people still go back to is to use an older technology, sharp electrode recording, where instead of trying to seal onto the cell, you just make the uh, glass capillary very small at the tip and then poke it directly into the neuron. And this, to some extent, limits the uh, fluid exchange between the electrode and the cell, but it also results in a leak current because sharp electrodes don't seal well onto cell membranes. And so you could imagine completely eliminating uh, the dialysis uh, uh, by introducing a solid conductor into a sharp electrode, but it still wouldn't solve the problem of leak current, um, which immediately changes biophysical properties of the neuron and therefore would be undesirable if you're trying to uh, assay the neuron in its native state. Um, so if we just think about it, there's probably some diameter at which uh, a nanoelectrode would insert into a cell membrane without causing a very large leak. I imagine a, a line of atoms probably wouldn't cause a very significant change in, the, in <coughs> biophysics to the cell. Um, but uh, there's obviously uh, a diameter at which it will cause a leak. And there were, some early, there were some early experiments in atomic force microscopy, and additionally just data from sharp electrodes that said that the, the cutoff was around, say, 100 nanometers. Smaller than 100 nanometers seemed to be much less invasive than larger. And so, um, Maybe, uh, maybe between 100 and 500 nanometers. Um, so we started out uh, by d designing electrodes that are uh, solid, so, so very similar to Hubel and Weasel's uh, extracellular recording electrodes, um, but at the very tip they're nanoscopic in, in diameter, let's say two to 300 nanometers in diameter. Um, and we just want to see if we can, if we can put something like this into a cell, uh, if, it, if the cell will stay alive and if we can record an electrical signal. Um, so I'll tell you quickly about how they're made. We put a tungsten wire into a conventional glass capillary, uh, glue the wire in the back with a gold pin, uh, pull the capillary similar to conventional microelectrode. Uh, then I etch the tungsten to a very sharp point, sort of a microscopically sharp point, um, and insulate the entire thing. I then take the insulated tungsten microelectrode to a focused ion beam. A focused ion beam uh, is similar to a uh, scanning electron microscope, except instead of using electrons, it uses uh, gallium ions, which are heavier, and therefore when they hit the sample, they ablate it. So if you have a combined electron microscope and focused ion beam, you can image the sample and cut it at the same time. Uh, so just a little schematic of what I'm doing, then is I take the microelectrode, I cut it with the focused ion beam, I turn it over and cut it again so that now I have a uh, very sharp uh, nanoscopic post at the end of a microelectrode. Um, if you imagine how this would insert into the cell, you then have a large surface that would be extracellular and therefore would be a leak, and that has to be uh, re-insulated by an electron beam assisted chemical vapor deposition process. Um, but that's fairly straightforward. So now we have these electrodes. Uh, the final step, the uh, kind of critical step in getting them into cells turned out to be silane treatment. So uh, an unmodified probe does not insert into the cell membrane, and it actually, the membrane will deform quite a bit, a little bit like an underinflated balloon if you try to just stick something into it. But if you uh, treat the surface to make it a bit more hydrophobic, they insert uh, quite readily into cells. So now there, there's still a little bit of a question of what kind of signal to, we would expect to record with such a small surface area tip. 
So although it's desirable from the standpoint of penetration to make the, the tip very small, from the standpoint of electrical coupling, the uh, electrode-electrolyte interface uh, becomes very high impedance as you make the surface area smaller. So we initially did a few experiments just to test uh, what kinds of signals we might expect. Um, so, yeah, the, the, as the electrical impedance gets very high, it forms a voltage divider with the strain capacitance uh, and, and other strain impedances in the recording setup, which ultimately attenuates uh, the signal. So, dis, as a little bit uh, simpler construction than making nano electrodes and testing their surface area, uh, we just made, we simply exposed very small surface areas from insulated uh, microelectrodes and then plotted their uh, impedance against the surface area and the uh, frequent and frequency and came up and you can see here that uh, in the regime that we're looking at the uh, impedance is uh, the impedance is, is uh, uh, sorry which I say the um, uh, the impedance is inversely uh, related to the surface area and um, it's uh, the imp impedance also falls off with frequency um, it's it can, could be thought of as, as essentially a capacitance so Given that we've also measured the uh, input impedance to our system, we were able to calculate expected transfer functions for our electrodes. I think maybe the most important thing is um, that from these we would expect a, something as small as one square micron in surface area could give uh, a, could record an action potential at approximately 10% uh, 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 amplitude. So you would be looking at maybe 10 millivolt action potentials. And I think really quickly, something that I, I heard people talking about yesterday, and I just wanted to kind of touch on this thread, a lot of electrophysiologists are concerned about distortions. Um, they're, they always, they're always fiddling with their capacitance compensation knobs um, because they want their action potentials to be a full 100 millivolts. But I think um, now with digital processing being as good as it is and with uh, deconvolution techniques, I think it's, it's relatively pointless to try to uh, optimize the... Uh, optimize the response uh, of your electrode um, through these kinds of feedback techniques because you can always de uh, deconvolute uh, either on the fly using some kind of FPGA or post hoc. Um, so I, that's one aspect where I think that um, advances in uh, signal processing have really changed the um, strategy for something like uh, designing the electronics of uh, amplifiers. It can be a lot simpler now. Um, so now to sort of get to the most important thing, um, to make the to validate these nanoelectrodes, the, uh, the paradigm here is that we'll make a patch recording from a cell and then insert a nanoelectrode. And this is an important uh, control because in, in, say, sharp microelectrode recording, if you do this, if you patch record a cell and then you insert a sharp microelectrode, you'll see that the resting membrane potential will become depolarized and the input resistance will drop because you've introduced a hole. So when we do this with a nanoelectrode, in, in some cases, we see that we can make a recording uh, without disrupting the cellular properties. So here you see um, I'm injecting current in the, in the, uh, whole cell, from the whole cell uh, electrode, and uh, the, it, the cell is firing action potentials. And then uh, at first, the nanoelectrode is out of plane. Um, then I insert it into the cell, and you can see the emergence of the signal in the nanoelectrode channel without seeing any change in the whole cell recording, indicating that the recording is still healthy. Um, Importantly, I can, I can record both action potentials and sub-threshold potentials, going back to this idea of recording both inputs and outputs of a cell. That's very important. And uh, finally, uh, when you look um, for a minority of cases, and I, sh I should emphasize this, in most cases, this insertion uh, results in a leak current in the same way as sharp electrode recording. But in, in a small number of cases, you can get the recording uh, without changing input resistance, resting membrane potential, or AP half width which is very interesting and in it's uh, suggesting that this uh, is a useful way forward for uh, developing non-invasive uh, recording electrodes. So now I should sort of get back to uh, some of the limitations and some of the things that we need to work on. Um, the success rate for insertion is, is about 10%. In about 10% of cases, we insert the nanoelectrode without causing any physiological changes to the neuron. Um, Next, the signal amplitudes that we would have expected based on the transfer functions that I, that I showed you earlier um, uh, aren't seen in the recordings that we make. And I think the reason is because we have impartial penetration of the de-insulated uh, metal electrode into uh, the cell. And that results in a, in a 
immediate voltage divider between the portion of the electrode that's intracellular and the portion that's extracellular, um, which is resulting in uh, signal attenuation. Um, the next thing is that the recordings are short. Um, this, isn't, this isn't a long-term recording technology yet. And the reason for this is that the membrane seems to reseal, even in the successful recordings, the membrane reseals around the probe to the exclusion of the probe from the cytoplasm. So here you can see um, in the whole cell channel the cell is firing action potentials. If you look quickly, here's a, an overlay on the right of action potentials from period one, period two, and period three. Um, nothing changes in the whole cell recording, but if you look at the nanoelectrode recording, the uh, amplitude of the action potential falls off on a time scale of tens of seconds. And uh, we believe that this is due to membrane resealing around the probe. So to quickly summarize, uh, it's possible to record both uh, action potentials and sub-threshold potentials using uh, solid conduct conductor intracellular nanoelectrodes. Uh, these recordings can be achieved without damaging the cell. Um, but improvements are still needed for the electrode, electro, uh, electrode membrane interface in order to make this technology viable. So now, um, the three limitations that I listed, success rate, uh, duration, and signal amplitude, uh, I think that they're all related to this uh, probe membrane interaction. <coughs> the success rate having to do with the energetic favorability of insertion uh, versus staying outside of the cell, and also the, kind of, um, the kinetics, uh, if it takes a very long time, uh, this, is, this is not uh, for rearrangement of the membrane around the probe, that this is not optimal. Uh, the duration, because the, uh, when the probe is inserted in the into the membrane, this needs to represent a local energetic minima. You don't want the, the probe to come out very easily. And finally, the signal amplitude, because you really want the membrane to bind at the interface between the de-insulated electrode and the, and the insulation um, in order to avoid having this voltage divider that I showed you earlier. Um, now the good news is, I think that all of these problems uh, have really been solved not by me. Uh, so Ben Olmquist and Nick Malash at Stanford have been working on some very interesting technology um, producing atomic force probes with uh, similar geometry to the recording electrodes that I've been using uh, where they put a very small gold band on the tip of the probes that's about the thickness of the hydrophobic uh, part of the lipid bilayer. And uh, this, gold, this gold band can be modified by a thiol reagent to make it hydrophobic. And then the topology of the probe that they use has uh, the same uh, amphipathic nature as an integral membrane protein. And these probes insert spontaneously into the lipid bilayer. Uh, so the idea is we, I'm now sort of jointly between Nick, uh, Nick Malosh and uh, Andreas Schaefer in Heidelberg, um, we're going to work on producing the same kind of electrodes that I've been producing with this uh, special gold band uh, at the border of the uh, de-insulated electrode and the uh, electrode insulation. And so it would look something uh, like this. Um, particularly, I, now we, we've stopped using tungsten as an electric material. We're using iridium oxide. It has a much lower electrochemical impedance, so it will also improve the signal to noise. Um, but I'll just quickly show you, this is a, an EM of such a probe uh, that we've made in the last few months. And um, yeah, in the, next, uh, in the next few months, we'll be testing them uh, in vitro. And uh, I hope that this will be, uh, yield some interesting results. So uh, I'd like to thank uh, my PhD advisor, Andreas Schaefer. Um, lab support was provided by uh, Marlies Kaiser, Ellen Steer, and Andy uh, Migala. Uh, the synthesis of the particular silane reagent that I used to make the probes hydrophobic uh, was by Herbert Zimmermann and Maya Kuhn. Um, it actually was a bit uh, fortunate that, that, that this work, we were originally synthesizing this as a UV crosslinker uh, to stabilize the electrode in tissue, uh, but it turned out that the hydrophobicity became uh, the most important uh, property and it actually allowed for the recordings that we made. Um, finally, uh, Christian Kiza and Jürgen Tuchark in the electronics workshop and uh, uh, Christian Feinhauer, Leonard Edel, uh, Leonard Edel uh, helped with the fabrication and insulation testing. And then, of course, my uh, new lab, uh, Nick Malosh, VJ, Katie, and Nathan uh, are all working on this stealth pro recording now. Uh, thank you. Uh, this, and it was funded by the Max Planck Society, so I have a small acknowledgement here.
So there's no force required to get them into the membrane, is I guess what, we, what I mean by spontaneous. Um, there's no insertion force, but there's a retraction force indicating that it's stuck. What do you imagine is going on physically when that, um, when that occurs, when that insertion occurs? Why is it firing a force on the uh, Even if it was a knitting needle on a sofa, um, you still have to want some force. You know? or, or what do you think is going on? I'm not sure. I mean, I. I guess there's a there's a local rearrangement of the of the bilayer when you bring something uh, that close. Um, I don't. I, I'm not sure. I, I'm not sure. It does seem a little bit counterintuitive. I think you're right. There should be some energetic barrier, um, but I, I don't know. Two questions, I guess. Uh, number one is uh, what's the effect on the impedance and capacitance of the side of the electrode tip, uh, and is this a viable? I think the effect of it, the unexpectedly, the, the signaling region didn't have a very strong effect on the, the impedance. Um, it, it only increased it by something like 10 or 20 percent. And I think this kind of speaks to one of the reasons why we're not pursuing this anymore is it's um, signaling reagents don't form nice monolayers on surfaces. Um, they tend to polymerize uh, in solution depending on, depending on how you're doing the treatment um, and form sort of uh, rather like two to three nanometer networks uh, on the surface. And um, it's very difficult. We don't know exactly what the arrangement is of the silane on the, on the probe. Um, it's obviously not, it's not a complete monolayer. If you, have a, if you have a perfect monolayer, that really increases the impedance because it's difficult for ions to get to the electric surface. At the same time, uh, we found that it's absolutely necessary for uh, membrane penetration. So it must be uh, doing something. People have looked at, people have worked for a long time on carbon fiber microelectrodes. How, do, how are, they, are they fundamentally different in some way from metal? Um, no. So we thought a little bit about, I mean, a carbon fiber is in many ways nicer than a tungsten wire. Um, it's also electrolytically etchable. But I think the big difference between tungsten and carbon is the uh, electrochemical capacitance. Um, so tungsten has a much higher capacitance. Um, due to what, what's called a kind of pseudo-capacitive coupling, which means there's actually a, a charge transfer reaction that occurs in the, ox, in the native oxide coating uh, that facilitates um, the movement of charge between the electrode and solution, whereas car bare carbon uh, doesn't have this property. And so um, it, it's less desirable, I think, for recording uh, uh, high-frequency signals. We haven't. I mean, there's only a little bit of uh, there's only a little bit of literature on this because not many people um, put metal structures into cells and then and then watch them. I mean, there's some evidence that tungsten might be a bad choice because of, in biolistics, people have been using tungsten uh, microcarriers for like, probably 20 years now, um, and they found that there is some toxicity associated with the use of tungsten versus gold nanoparticles. Um, I think the use of other materials, um, now I think the most interesting materials might be iridium oxide, uh, manganese oxide, um, some materials that are used in the supercapacitor industry uh, for charge storage. Um, there's really no data on what the effect of putting something like that in a cell would be. But I, I would say that because they're not water soluble, um, they should be relatively inert. Perfect. Oh, thanks. All right.